on World News Tonight. Tory in trouble. The UK Conservative Party is rushing to find new leadership following Liz Truss's swift exit. Energy emergency. The EU struggles to come to a consensus on a budget cap for gas prices, with all of Europe feeling the strain. Power struggle. Ukraine prepares for the worst, with electricity grids taking the brunt of Russia's impact. And colors of fall. Autumn takes on vibrant hues in South Korea. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we start off tonight with the breaking news. Pakistan's Election Commission disqualified former Prime Minister Imran Khan from holding public office after its tribunal found him guilty of unlawfully selling state gifts given by foreign dignitaries and heads of state. The decision is another twist in political wrangling that began even before Khan's April ouster and is one of several legal battles being fought by the former international cricket star and his Pakistan PTI party. Khan, who has denied the charge, was accused of misusing his position to purchase and sell gifts received during state visits abroad that were worth over 140 million Pakistani rupees. The tribunal will deliver a detailed ruling later in the day. Faisal Chaudhry, a lawyer in Khan's team, said that the Election Commission Tribunal had no jurisdiction in the matter and said a challenge would be lodged in the High Court. The ruling coalition that took over from Khan after his ouster in a confidence vote earlier this year had filed the case before the election commission. Despite the chaos in commons of the UK Parliament, it seems financial markets are not taking any major hits, with the pound sterling rallying and stocks maintaining some stability. Sterling rallied on Thursday as British Prime Minister Liz Truss announced that she and her economic plans had hit the end of the road after just six weeks at the helm. Her resignation followed a humiliating reversal of almost all of her economic program, one that jolted markets, pushed up living costs for many Brits and enraged her own Conservative ruling party. And we set out a vision for a low-tax, high-growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate. The UK's main stock indexes also closed higher Thursday, and investors dial back bets on a full percentage point interest rate hike by the Bank of England next month. European shares rose on the news, as did US stocks, with US President Joe Biden shrugging off any economic spillover effects. No, I don't think they're that consequential. Liz Truss is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. In her campaign for the party's leadership, Truss had pledged to shake up economic orthodoxy. But plans for vast unfunded tax cuts crashed the pound and British bonds. She was forced to fire her finance minister last week, with his replacement scrapping almost all of their economic program. I am a fighter and not a quitter. Approval ratings for her and the Conservative Party have tanked with the UK economy heading for recession and inflation at a 40-year high. New Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt still needs to find tens of billions of pounds in spending cuts before delivering a new budget by the end of October. He's already ruled himself out of a leadership election due within the week. With the swift exit of Liz Truss from her very brief premiership, there is concern on who will take the charge to lead the Tories to better governance. While new faces are also coming into the picture, it seems that Boris Johnson might be making a comeback. Who will replace Liz Truss as Britain's Prime Minister? I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. After just 44 days in office, the shortest tenure in British history, Truss announced her resignation on Thursday, firing off the starting gun for yet another leadership race. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. Yeah, Rishi Sunak, who was runner-up against Truss over the summer, is a firm favourite. The former finance minister sounded an early warning about Truss's economic agenda. Rising inflation is the enemy that makes everyone poorer and puts at risk your homes and your savings. He first gained popularity, steering Britain through the COVID pandemic, dropping conservative instincts for a small state and borrowing massively to 
to support workers and businesses. He was the preferred candidate amongst Conservative MPs in the summer leadership race, but lost out in the membership vote. Many of them saw him as responsible for Boris Johnson's downfall. Which brings us to the next potential candidate. And it's perfectly true, it's perfectly true that I leave not at a time of my choosing. Johnson was kicked out of office in July following a string of scandals and still faces an investigation for allegedly lying in Parliament about parties held during lockdown. However, the face of Brexit was once seen by many as a vote winner. In the 2019 general election, he won votes in parts of the country that had never backed the Conservatives before. Johnson was on a holiday in the Caribbean when Truss announced she was quitting. But British media reports on Thursday suggested he was flying back. I hope you enjoyed your holiday, boss. Time to come back, one Conservative lawmaker, James Dudridge, said on Twitter, adding, hashtag bring back Boris. Seemingly loved and loathed in equal measure, some Conservative MPs may quit if he wins. Hasta la vista, baby. Thank you. The third candidate likely to enter the race is Penny Mordaunt. A former Defence Secretary, she only just missed reaching the final two in the summer leadership race. Mordaunt, like Johnson and Sunak, was a passionate supporter of leaving the European Union and is seen by some as having broad appeal in the party. The PM is detained on urgent business. She won plaudits for her performance in Parliament on Monday when she defended the government even as it reversed most of its policies. The Prime Minister is not uh, under a desk as the... <laughs> she... Jeremy Hunt, the current Finance Minister, has ruled himself out. To enter the contest, the candidate needs the votes of 100 MPs by Monday. Any more U-turns? Thank, Thank you, sir. Workers at a Total Energy's biorefinery and a fuel depot in northern France have ended their strikes as a near-month-long wave of industrial action over pay appeared to run out the steam. The weakening strike movement will allow fuller distribution to products of service stations, bringing relief to households and businesses, though it may be two or three weeks before refineries are fully operational. Relief is in sight for French drivers as workers at Total Energy ended their strikes at all but two refineries in France on Thursday, a union representative told. It follows nearly four weeks of disruption to supply, long lines at gas stations and frayed nerves across the country. About one in five petrol stations in France is still grappling with the shortages. But things have been improving since the government increased imports and ordered some depot staff to return to work. Morning staff at Total Energy La Med refinery and at a storage site in Dunkirk chose to resume work, the CGT union representative said. The same decision was taken at the Donge refinery on Wednesday. Total Energy struck a wage agreement with a majority of its unions earlier this month. Workers will get an average pay rise of 7% next year, according to the company. The hardline CGT union wanted 10% and did not approve the deal. But the appetite to stay on strike appeared to wane. Only morning staff at the Normandy and Faisan refineries would stay off work, pending a vote at the start of the next shift. Meanwhile, European Union leaders struggle to find immediate practical solutions at their summit called to grapple with the energy crisis fueled by the war in Ukraine and maintain a united front in the face of Russian President Vladimir Putin's coalition. The leaders did, however, leave the summit with a satisfactory agreement and a possible roadmap on how to approach the issue. European Union leaders are meeting for the second time in two weeks to try to bring down energy prices though persistent divisions make a cap on what the bloc pays for gas unlikely for now. This was EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on the eve of Thursday's summit. I know that Europeans are concerned. Concerned about inflation, concerned about their energy bills, concerned about the winter. The best response to Putin's gas blackmail is European solidarity and European unity. Fifteen countries, including France and Poland, are pushing for a cap, but they face strong opposition from Germany, which is Europe's biggest economy and gas buyer, and the Netherlands, a major gas trading hub. Members are expected to back some of the energy proposals the EU made this week, including an alternative price benchmark for liquefied natural gas and joint gas buying. 
They've already agreed to fill gas storage and claw back revenues from energy firms to spend on helping consumers with crippling bills amid a cost-of-living crisis. But they remain split on whether and how to cap gas prices to stem high inflation and stave off recession, after Russia cut gas flows following its invasion of Ukraine. Discussions could run well into the night and could fail to agree on immediate action to tackle high energy prices ahead of winter. EU energy ministers meet again next week and aim to agree on final measures in November. And as energy crises continue, Ukrainians conserved electricity and some went without running water to ease pressure on the grid and allow the repair of infrastructure destroyed by Russian airstrikes as Kyiv's forces advanced towards the city of Kherson. As Russian forces continue to pound Ukrainian cities, destroying infrastructure like power facilities and water systems, Ukraine is for the first time in the war facing the prospect of significant nationwide energy blackouts. And in a desperate race to save the power grid, its government on Thursday has started putting restrictions on energy use in place. It says it wants to cut power by about 20% to allow repair teams to work on the system, beginning with a 16-hour cutback that started at 7 a.m. Thursday morning. Ukraine's energy minister says he's seen a voluntary decrease in electricity consumption, but when it's not enough, they'll have to bring in forced shutdowns. So far, and depending on the area, power cuts have included shutting off street lighting and replacing electric public transport buses with diesel. One region also cut off its water supply for the day. In markets, some were seen stocking up on bottled water. Ukraine is continuing to press counteroffensives against Russian forces in the east and south of the country, although it's struggling to protect power-generating facilities from missile and drone strikes. Parts of Ukraine have been without these services for a long time, but Russia's targeting of infrastructure has increased dramatically in recent weeks, a tactic which appears designed to disrupt and demoralize as winter approaches. Let's go into short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The now-jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny has not been given any hope of an end to the political fool judicial assault as fresh allegations were leveled against him, adding to his jail sentence. Jailed Russian opposition leader and fierce Vladimir Putin critic Alexei Navalny said authorities have opened a new criminal case against him, potentially more than doubling his sentence. Navalny is already serving prison terms totaling 11 and a half years for fraud, contempt of court and parole violations, all of which he rejects as bogus charges intended to silence him. The new charges, Navalny said, were for promoting terrorism and extremism, something he scoffed at in a series of sarcastic social media posts on Thursday, in which he compared himself to the fictional nemesis of Sherlock Holmes by writing, I am a genius of the underworld. Professor Moriarty is no match for me. You all thought I had been isolated in prison for two years, but it turns out I was actively committing crimes. Navalny's spokeswoman said the case is related to a YouTube channel called Popular Politics that was launched by his allies after he had already been in prison for a year. Navalny has long been a thorn in Putin's side, campaigning against endemic corruption in Russia in witty and slickly produced videos that drew huge audiences on social media. In 2020, he was poisoned with a nerve agent during a trip to Siberia. The Kremlin denied involvement. Navalny was arrested for parole violations when he returned to Russia at the start of 2021. He has called Russia's invasion of Ukraine stupid and built on lies and has continued to attack Putin. There was no immediate official confirmation of the new case from Russia's investigative committee. With the South Korean won, the Japanese yen and the Chinese yuan depreciating heavily against the U.S. dollar in recent months. Experts are increasingly warning of a potential foreign exchange market crisis in Northeast Asia. Two of Asia's major currencies are seeing some of the most significant declines against the U.S. dollar in years, if not decades. The Chinese yuan, which is considered Asia's key currency, recently fell to around 7.27 yuan against the greenback, 
the lowest in 14 years since the 2008 global financial crisis. Another of Asia's key currencies, the Japanese yen, saw its value cross the 150 yen level for the first time in 32 years. With the two major Asian currencies falling helplessly in value, it raises major concerns about capital outflows from Asia, as well as the possibility of a region-wide financial crisis. In addition, the falling value of the currencies from the two economic giants is also putting downward pressure on other Asian currencies, including the Korean one. Some experts say key Asian currencies are plummeting due to fears of worsening inflation, soaring interest rates, and a possible economic recession. However, for the most part, analysts say the cause is the continuous rate hikes by the U.S. Fed, with the central banks in Asia unable to keep up with the pace. Pessimists predict that if the yen and the yen continues to fall in this way, the result could be reminiscent of the 1997-1998 Asian financial crisis, which saw South Korea seek a massive rescue package from the International Monetary Fund. Deadly clashes between police and demonstrators protesting at the military's grip on power erupted in Chad, claiming at least 50 lives, including members of the security forces. The United Nations condemned the lethal use of force against the protesters and demanded a probe to be launched. Dozens of people were killed and hundreds injured in violence that broke out in Chad on Thursday, according to Prime Minister Saleh Kebzabo. He told a news conference the government was still compiling casualties from what he described as an armed insurrection. But human rights groups said unarmed civilians were massacred as security forces brutally cracked down on demonstrations in the capital, Ndamena, and several other cities. It comes after pro-democracy protesters took to the streets, calling for a swifter transition to democratic rule. The country is ruled by a military council led by President Mohamed Idris Deby, who took over following the battlefield death of his father, President Idris Deby, in 2021. The council was only meant to rule for 18 months, but pushed back elections to October 2024. The 18-month period expired on Thursday, prompting opposition and civil society groups to call people to the streets. The government banned the protests, but demonstrators were defiant, barricading roads and torching the party headquarters of the new prime minister. Security forces responded with tear gas, live rounds and arbitrary arrests, according to rights groups. Riots have been intermittent in Chad since the younger Deby seized power last year, but Thursdays appeared to be the bloodiest. A respiratory virus is wreaking havoc amongst children in the United States with up to 71% of pediatric beds being occupied. The flu-like virus could turn lethal and is predicted to be an unfortunate side effect of non-exposure due to the pandemic. With that surge in child respiratory viruses, tonight hospitals push to the brink. 71% of pediatric beds across the country are now filled, the highest level in two years. And many parents like Amanda Bentley want to warn other families. Her 18-month-old son Joshua has been in the hospital with RSV for more than a week. Hospitals in at least 34 states are treating a crush of children sick with RSV, flu and other viruses. Connecticut Children's in Hartford is scrambling to treat patients in hallways while they consider a plan with FEMA and the National Guard to set up a surge tent outside. Experts say parents should take their kids to the doctor or ER if they see signs of respiratory distress, like fast or labored breathing, a fever, or blue or discolored skin on the face signaling low oxygen. And while it's not COVID, doctors say one reason for the uptick is that during the pandemic, children weren't as exposed to viruses because of masking and social distancing. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A huge blaze erupted in central Mexico when a full tanker truck crashed into an overpass by a rail line, scorching homes, engulfing the area in thick smoke and leading to a mass evacuation, but there were no fatalities. Indonesia announced a sales ban on medication in liquid and syrup for following deaths of 99 children this year. The move comes after a local investigation found that some syrup medicines contain ingredients potentially linked to an acute kidney injury. Turkish President Erdogan has met Azerbaijani counterpart Ilham Aliyev in territory captured by Baku during Nogona-Karabakh war. The two leaders opened the second airport built in the area. 
French cement maker Lafarge pleaded guilty in U.S. court to a charge that it made payments to groups designated as terrorists in the United States, including Islamic State, so the company could keep operating in Syria. U.S. Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged Indian Premier Narendra Modi to take initiative in combating climate change in India. This is due to India being a major contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. With autumn in full swing, the magic of leaves that change hue is one to look out for. We leave you tonight with visuals of South Korea's Soraksan Mountain, which is one of the most well-known fall foliage attractions loved by both locals and tourists alike. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and have a good night.